Seminariets namn är Välkommen Gui Minai om situationen i Kina. Och det enda jag är säker på är att Gui Minai inte kommer komma. Det är... ja, ni är välkomna, absolut. Vi har Jesper Bengtsson som är ordförande i Svenska Pen, Svante Weiler, förläggare. Jo Olsson, journalist och Kina-kännare. Kristin Einarsson, eh, ordförande i International Publishers Association. Elisabeth Åsbrink, journalist och författare. Och detta ska modereras av Frida Edman från Bokmässan. Välkomna upp på scenen. Hallå. Hi, I'm Frida Edman. Uh, I'm the director of uh, Göteborg Book Fair. I'm uh, so glad to see you all here today. What we have to say about the situation in China is very important. In August, Göteborg Book Fair, together with Swedish Publishers Association, Swedish Pan, an International Publishers Association published an invitation to Guminai. An invitation to welcome him to this year's book fair. But he cannot be here for reasons we soon are going to talk more about. Therefore, we have installed a chair here at the Global Square around the corner and this, the chair will wait for him until he will be able to come here or choose by his own free will not to do so. I, together with all the book fair's friends, fighting for authors, journalists and publishers, rights to critic regimes without being threatened or even put in jail, beg to you who work close to China's regime. Maybe you are here today, one of you or two, or you, maybe you watch this video streaming out from here. To you, we want to say, free Gu Minhai, respect his human rights. And with that said, I would like to uh, let the, world, the microphone over to Svante Weiler, publisher, and he will introduce you to this seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Frida. Thank you, Frida. Um, let me first remind you of another empty chair. Uh, a couple of years ago, I can't say exactly when you might say that, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to Liu Xiaobo. Try to get back to that picture of the empty chair in that city hall of Oslo. It was never filled by uh, Liu Xiaobo. They let him die in prison. What we know about Gui Minhai is that he is also sick. He has a serious illness. We will probably hear more from that, my yo, -yo. So let that empty chair remind you of another empty chair and of a disrespectful policy of the Chinese authorities, to put it mildly. Um, I have a greeting from Elisabeth Orsprink, who was supposed to be on the panel. She was sent home by us because she's losing her voice. That's uh, something that happens at the book fair. But she has a message from Gui Minhai's daughter, Angela Gui, Angela Gui who's working insistently to uh, get the words 
attention for her father's fate. Angela is extremely happy and grateful for the work everybody else is also doing, for the work you're doing, and you will hear more about that later. Uh, sadly enough, she didn't have anything new to say about the situation of her father. So we must assume that the situation is as grave as it has been and that his health is in danger. Uh, now I'll introduce the chair, uh, and you'll hear more of them uh, to your right. Kristen Einarsson from the Norwegian Publishers Association. Director is your title, I suppose. Uh, but he has also another uh, function in the international publishing world. He is head of Writers in Prison Committee, uh, or Freedom to Publish Committee. Freedom to Publish Committee, which is the part of the International Publishers Association that has the responsibility to work with the case of Gui Min Hai. That's correct, isn't it? In the center, Yu Yu Ulson, who is probably the person who knows mo most about the case, Gui Min Hai and the, case, uh, and the cases that have appeared uh, or occurred uh, with similar, um, with persons with a similar background as Gui Min Hai. And he'll fill us in on all the Actual, uh, st the actual standing of the case. And here Jesper Bengtsson, chairman of the Swedish PEN, also very much engaged in this case. I'll start with you, Julia, because you have so much more actual knowledge about this. Tell me, when and how did you hear about the kidnapping from Thailand of Gui Minh Hai? Yeah, as uh, most of you already know, Gui Minh Hai was kidnapped uh, the first time in uh, October 2015. And uh, to get information about this case, it was uh, not possible to read Swedish media or listen to Swedish uh, organizations or politicians. It was media in Hong Kong and the English-speaking media in uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong and the US and the UK, even Japanese media, who uh, was the first to write about this case. It uh, took quite a long time before it was uh, made a big, uh, made a big uh, case in Sweden. So I must say that uh, how I got to hear from it was from uh, international media and international organizations that are writing about and reporting about China. Most of us know the, the, the roughly the circumstances about the kidnapping. He was taken from his home by a couple of men uh, in Thailand and taken to, to uh, mainland China. Uh, but why were the Chinese authorities so interested in Gui Minh Hai? Yeah, so it's important to note that uh, China got a new president in 2013. His name is uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, he wants to stop the flow of books from Hong Kong to China. The flow of uh, books who are criticizing the regime or the political system in China. Uh, Gui Minh Hai had already been working for uh, almost a decade with the same uh, publishing business before Xi Jinping became president. But a couple of years after he became president, uh, a campaign was launched to stop the poisonous books to reach mainland China from Hong Kong. And that was done in various ways. Uh, there was uh, threats issued to uh, publishers, to printers, to bookstores. If you sell books that are critical f to the Chinese regime, you might lose your business opportunities in the mainland. But this was not enough because the books still started, uh, continued to stream into China from Hong Kong. So to really scare off both customers and publishers, they decided to kidnap Gui Min Hai and also his four colleagues. and. Uh, have them made forced confessions on televisions and uh, after this happened you can see that uh, the publishing of those books has really really dived really decreased i was interviewing one of the biggest publishers who are left in hong kong and that is writing this kind of uh, literature and he said that after Gui Min Hai was on television his sales have been plummeting by some 80 percent so it was an efficient way to uh, stop the literature from hong kong that is uh, allowed to be published in Hong Kong to spread to mainland China. Could you back uh, even a little bit more? Who is he? Why is he a Swedish citizen? Yeah. So, uh, Gui Min Hai, he was born in Ningbo in eastern China. 
he then got an opportunity to study at Gothenburg University. So he is uh, fr fr yeah, from Gothenburg. He's been living here and studying here. This was 1988. Uh, and everyone knows what happened in 1989. It was the Tiananmen Square massacre. And after that, it became very dangerous for intellectuals to return to China. So he uh, got Swedish citizenship instead in 1992. And then he uh, lived and worked in Sweden for a while before in the mid-2000s he took up his passion again, which is writing and publishing books. And that he did in Hong Kong. Uh, and that was why he started to publish this kind of uh, books that are critical to, to the Chinese uh, political system. We have to stop a little bit there because soon after he was taken to mainland China, the start, there was a start of spreading of rumors about who he was. I heard them myself. Um, and the, the big thing was that the Chinese said uh, he's caused a car accident, so he's here to uh, take the punishment for that. But there was also other rumors spread they were hard to, to um, sort of uh, understand what was in them, if they were true or not. What kind of rumors and where did they come from were spread around uh, Wei Minhai? And from by whom? Yeah, as you said, uh, when he was first kidnapped, he was uh, made a forced confession on TV. He was paraded on TV. And in that confession, he had to say that, uh, oh, I wasn't kidnapped. I, I just uh, turned myself into the Chinese police because 10 years ago there was a car accident. And all of a sudden I have a bad conscience for that accident. So now I want to, uh, now I want to hand myself over to the police. It was, it was an obvious uh, lie, right? Uh, and then, uh, which I described in my new book that was launched yesterday, uh, starting from this year, the Chinese embassy here in Sweden, they launched a smearing campaign against uh, Gui Minhai. They have been contacting journalists, organizations, even politicians by mail, by post, by phone even, by text messages, where they try to uh, apply some false narrative uh, to Gui Minhai that when he was living in Sweden, they accused him for opening uh, some kind of fake institution uh, that was tied to Gothenburg University, which he then used to trick a lot of Chinese students of their money. And when this uh, was exposed, uh, he fled Sweden to avoid uh, justice. And also his acts was said to have uh, uh, led to two Chinese students taking suicide. So in the book now that I have been writing, uh, I contact the, the professors on Gothenburg University who had been working with him when he was living in Sweden. And they confirmed that Gui Minhai did not start a school. They started a the school. They hired Gui Minhai for, for, for a couple of years. Uh, they also confirmed that those two suicides that uh, the Chinese embassy was talking about uh, only one case was a suicide and it had nothing to do with the school. The second case was an accident uh, and uh, in the police investigations there were no uh, suspicions at all uh, either against this institute or against Gui Minhai. His name was never mentioned in any internal revision from Gothenburg University or any police report. So what the Chinese embassy have been doing here is uh, one of their specialties, you would say, like a character assassination. They try to move focus from uh, the fact that they have been breaking international rules, international law, uh, in the way they are treating Gui Minhai, and instead they want to focus, they want to create some kind of discussion about Gui Minhai's personality instead. Uh, so they take a history that has a little, little grain of truth, because he had been working in this institute for a couple of years. And then they exaggerate, uh, they lie, they make up things, and then they want to start a big discussion about that he is, in fact, uh, just some criminal that escaped Sweden. We'll come back to that campaign if it's uh, something uh, extraordinary for his case, uh, or, in, or, or if you've seen this strategy being used by uh, Chinese authorities in other cases as well. But I want to say, to finish your, Clara, how is his situation today? 
What do you know of the situation today? As you said before, Svante, there's not much news. I contacted the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs last week to get the latest updates. They replied to me two days ago and uh, they said they, they don't want to specify where he is being held. And also, they did confirm that for the first time in almost three years, Guaymin Hai has been allowed to see a Swedish doctor, but they would not comment on whether there was a medical examination or, or the results of this. So, after he disappeared from the train, when he was snatched from the train in January this year, there is not much news at all about the situation. So, so what you're saying is that there's a, do a Swedish doctor have been seeing him, but it, they're not allowed to say what the result of the examination was? I don't know if they are allowed or not, but they have decided not to say anything. If they because, don't say because anything, maybe must, they think if they say be, something, there yeah. will not be a second visit. Or yeah, it must be there. interpreted as a as a condition for seeing him that they don't report. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, Christian, uh, he's a Swede. Guminhai is a Swedish publisher. Uh, I'm, I'm a Swedish publisher too, and I have to say, it took some time for us, colleagues of him, to state the simple fact there's a Swedish colleague sitting in jail in, in China. Uh, you've seen, you've observed this from Norway and from the International Publishers Association. How come it took us so long to recognize a colleague that has been snapped from Thailand and start working on the case? I'm not blaming you. I just want to know why we were so slow, if well, you have an explanation. I think um, the whole world, uh, and we also, were slow. A bit closer. Uh, yeah, he, uh, he got the pre-volt here this year. He was nominated last year as well. Uh, that time we chose uh, our Turkish colleagues. Uh, one of the problems is there's a lot of difficult situations for publishers all around the world. And there is uh, increasingly pressure on publishing. And what uh, the pressure is, is doing is that you see self-censorship. And I'll, I'll get back to that and, and uh, how China is working on more than gaming high. But um, I think one of the questions is that, uh, that this happened. He had a business in Hong Kong. He was abducted from Thailand. It's a bit far from Scandinavia. But I think it's so important that this is changed now. And I was in a meeting last week together with uh, the Swedish PA and the European Publishers PA Association. PA is Publishers Association. Association. Sorry, yes. And with the EU Commission. And we really feel that they are working hard on this because he's not only a Swedish citizen, he's also an EU citizen. And if this starts that China can pick out EU citizens and just take them into prison. Uh, so I think that helps of the interest in what he is doing. But it is something special to see, and you were talking about this forced uh, television, and the last one came just 10 days before we awarded him the pre Voltaire. It was known that he has got it, and in that interview he said that he didn't want Swedes to get involved, and he didn't want the pre Voltaire Prize. And the pre Voltaire is the, the International Publishers Association's prize given to somebody doing something very special in the field of publishing. Right. And, and, it's, and the high, it's the finest prize you have. It's the finest get. prize we have. And, and it means that we will continue to work for all our pre Voltaire winners. And it is a kind of acknowledgement from the Chinese government that the prize is important when he has to refuse it on television. But if I can just put it into context uh, a little bit, if I may. Yes. Uh, China uh, is increasingly putting pressure not only on those uh, publishers in Hong Kong that they don't like, but they also, in a way, censoring platforms entering the op more open Chinese market. Uh, we had a situation with Springer uh, platform for Springer Nature uh, earlier this year that decided to censor part of the platform about Tibet, Dalai Lama, and stuff like that. Where the situation in Australia, where an Australian publisher decided not to publish a book, it has been taken up by another publisher, but that was because they were frightened about their business with China. And uh, this is this is important for the whole international 
publishing world to be aware of. And we are seeing, you know, from pressure groups, from governments, from different libel laws and everything, there's an increasing pressure on publishing and we have to fight all the time. And are you fighting? Well, we are doing our best. This, uh, we are a small committee, nine members, but we are really engaging in everything. Everything from twice blaming Mr. Trump for putting his lawyers on American publishers to working day-to-day -day basis on the case of Gimmen High. And we have close contact with his daughter as well. Because there's, there's a backstory here that both of us were a little bit involved in. The Chinese Publishing Association is now a member of the International Publishers Association, though they break the rules. The first rule in the National Publishers Association is freedom to publish. And just to give you an idea of the situation in China, the censorship authority in China shares the same building with the Chinese Publishers Association. So if you want to send two letters, it's the same address and that says it all. And they are now a member of an organization that we are a member of. Norway, were, they were against it, Sweden were against it, but Australia, I suppose, was for it and was a pressure from England. They wanted business opportunities. Those countries who were so engaged in getting China into the family, what do they say now? Do they act on the case of Gui Minai or are they shutting up? Well, uh, an outcome of, um, of what you described was that the Freedom to Publish Committee got a new status. So the Freedom to Publish Committee is elected by the General Assembly and reports only to the General Assembly. So the board cannot interfere in our work. And that was so important because the biggest countries get automatic a place on the board. So China is on the board. And I can tell you, yes, I've got some letters from our Chinese member and uh, they are not very polite. But, uh, but they will not change the policy. It's only the General Assembly that can change on the policy on the freedom to publish issues in IPA. Just a last question on your Norwegian experience. I mentioned Liu Xiaobo before. The reaction in China was very strong. They told Norway to shut up. And the problem is that Norway shut up. There's no official criticism in Norway, as I understand, against Chinese breaking, the Chinese breaking uh, the laws. And they were now uh, sort of uh, the, the, the test. Uh, they didn't fail. The Norwegian didn't fail. So the Chinese are now buying Norwegian salmon. It seems a little bit ridiculous, but selling salmon is really important in Norway. What's your feeling about the Norwegian s well, governmental silence during all these years? Yeah, you, you're right. The, well, it, it, it's, it's not quite right, because um, after the Nobel Prize award, uh, they really put Norway into the freezer. And it, it really dropped a lot of, um, of commerce. And for about four or five years, the situation was like that. Then they started talking, and about a year ago, they agreed on accepting each other's principles and stuff like that. I don't like it. I think we have sold something for Salmon, and we didn't need that. So I, I, I disagree with what has, has been done. But there's a lot of politicians who, who do not accept the official standing and are still working on the freedom to publish part of it. But, but the Norwegian government is not reacting like they did. From the Chinese point of view, would you say they succeeded? They, yes. try, they put Norwegian out of the business yeah, yeah. and then... Yeah. Yes, they, and, and this, is, you know, this is how important this is for the Chinese government. Yeah. Jesper, you're head of the Swedish PEN uh, and you're big of a big family. International PEN is a big family and you've been very active in many cases. What do you do in the case of Gui Minhai? Well, first of all, I would like to say that uh, even though it's very hard to actually have, a, have an effect on the Chinese authorities' uh, treatment of him, because n hardly anyone knows where he is, and probably the Swedish uh, Foreign Department now knows where he is, because they have, as you said before, uh, had a doctor visiting him, but they don't talk about it. Uh, and so it's very hard to... Uh, actually influence them but it's very easy to have other countries other pen centers other publishers all around the world active in this case uh, in 
Penn, we have a network of Penn centers all around the world, and um, there is uh, this uh, alert calls when a new case is uh, appearing, and uh, it was very easy to have this alert call on uh, Guimin High when it came, and uh, a number of Penn centers has been working with this case since. And there's been uh, the International Congress of Penn was ended only, I think, today or maybe yesterday. It's been in India, and uh, we had a delegation there. And uh, we also had uh, Guimin High's case as one of the statements from that, from that Congress. Uh, so that's, that's what we do, and we cannot, like you said, it's very hard to actually have an influence on, on what, what do, the do authorities do about it. Do but you talk to Chinese colleagues in any way? Yes, uh, I mean, China has a pen center, uh, Hong Kong has a pen center, so they are a part of this discussion, definitely. Mainland China, official China is part of international pen? Uh, I'm not really sure if it's uh, accepted as a pen center. I'm, I'm, I'm because there was an yeah. exiled Chinese exactly, exactly, uh, yes, pen yes. center. But we talk with colleagues about this, yes. And what's the reaction you get? when you talk to Chinese colleagues? Well, I think the same reaction as, as in many other countries. The, the, ca the thing here is that they not only threaten publishers in China or threaten publishers who has a background in China, what they say with this case is that we will take action anywhere in the world when we are disappointed with someone's uh, writing or someone's uh, publishing of a book. And no one can feel safe anywhere. And, and people see that. I mean, writers see this, publishers see this. And I think we have, what we have now is a situation where it's totally amazing to see the Chinese embassy, how they are acting now in this case and in Sweden. I had one of these letters you described before, trying to you know, lie about uh, Guimin Hai's background. Tell us a bit more in detail. That you got a letter from the China embassy yeah, that sure. dealt with you, yeah? Yeah. Ex how? What did no, they not say? with Joyo, jo with Guimin Hai. We go in high. Yeah. What did they say to you? Well, they, Joy, you mentioned it before. They talked about his, uh, his um, activities in Gothenburg in the beginning of the 90s. And they talked about his uh, driving accident, I think, and uh, crimes he should have committed in China. Mm. And the, the reason why I got it was that I signed one article uh, together with a number of other people about his case. And immediately they reacted and sent me this letter. And I know that everyone who signed that uh, article had the letter, and I think you had it as well. Uh, and th then they did this uh, poor acting of, of the two Chinese people who uh, were not allowed to stay in a hotel in Sweden, and they were sent away for, by the police. And, and I've been working a bit as a director, and I would say they were in desperate need of a director, because it was very poor acting. And the response came immediately from the uh, embassy in China saying that, look here, Sweden doesn't really live up to the, to the standards of uh, human rights. So how can you criticize China on this? And uh, this is a new strategy and, and a strategy... Have you heard about something like that before? You're an experienced man. You've been uh, working with these things before. Have you heard of any embassy in Sweden working this way? There has been... No, not really like that. No, I have never seen that before. You could say that some of the embassies, for, for example, the embassy of Eritrea, when it comes to the David Isa case, they have worked very active. In, they have been very active in Sweden. But this very open propaganda trick, I have not seen before. No, I haven't. Kristen, you're an experienced man as well. Have you heard about this kind of pressure from an official authority outside the mother country uh, working like this, uh, pressuring... Not, not that I am aware of, uh, but, but it's uh, quite similar to how they treated Norway after Lenship, but they did it in a more elegant way, I would say, than they do in Sweden. But um, certainly the pressure they started, uh, and, 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 and they, they, they used the commercial part much harder and they've been talking about that they've been talking about IKEA and stuff like that so I mean that might be the next one do you know of books that have been stopped no, by I publishers themselves no, uh, in Norway uh, n not at all no, uh, no. I, I don't and, and I don't think it, I know I don't think so maybe they wouldn't tell you <laughs> because self-censorship is not something you bribe about one of the targets main targets from the Chinese embassy is you Yoya why are they so angry with you 
Anyway, to begin with, it's uh, important to note here that uh, in uh, August uh, last year, uh, China got a new uh, ambassador to Sweden. He is very different than his uh, predecessor. Uh, he has never been in Sweden before. He never had a Swedish uh, friend before, he said in an interview. Uh, he has a background where he has been working in the, the Chinese embassy in Moscow for 10 years. He's also been working in Central Asia. He is now trying to implement the same methods in Sweden as he was using in those countries. Uh, it's likely that he doesn't really understand how media and civil organizations works in Sweden as, as compared to, to Russia. So at once when he arrived to his new post in Sweden, the Chinese embassy <coughs> suddenly got very more active. They started to send diplomats to uh, speeches and events that a civil society held. Do you see yes. anyone here? Do you see any representative from the Chinese? I, I, oh, don't I'm laugh. Sure. They attend meetings in Stockholm. They're in the back row photographing, and but yeah, you've, yeah, you've yeah, yeah. seen that. Uh, and also, uh, they started to contact uh, media organizations, and not only with uh, the smearing campaign against Gui Min Hai, also about other things, uh, especially issues like uh, Tibet, uh, Xinjiang, uh, and also they. Uh, publish a lot of uh, press statements on their website, which they, which they never did before, where they are attacking, well, they have been attacking me personally and also other people and, and some media, and they start to uh, invite medias to the embassy in uh, much more than they did before. So I've been talking to a lot of people who can notice the difference between this ambassador and the last ambassador. So it's very likely that he is trying to, very aggressively trying to win the debate, win the narrative about Gui Min Hai in Sweden uh, by trying to implement the same methods as, as he did before. Does and it also, work on you? Huh? Does it work on you? Do you behave better according to the Chinese? I would Do say you write that, less? Uh, yeah, I, I would say that his approach has been really, really counterproductive in, on, on all levels, really. As, uh, as I said earlier this week when I was interviewed by, by a newspaper that I have never seen as many critical articles about the political system in China being published in Swedish media than during the last six months when he started to use this aggressive approach. So I would say that, yeah, this approach doesn't work, which I'm very glad for. And of course, uh, this uh, tourist incident that you mentioned before, and also you have the Swedish television, they broadcasted a satire, satire show. Uh, where the embassy goes out and demands not only an apology and compensation, but also demands that the police should be punished for following Swedish law. Uh, it is also an example where the Chinese embassy tried to scare Sweden into obedience. And uh, if Gui Min Hai, if the Gui Min Hai case was not in the background here, I am quite sure that the reaction would not have been as uh, strong. You want to comment on that? Yeah, but I also, I, I, it's great that you have done this research on uh, Gui Minhai's background because uh, even if I didn't believe a word, word of the letter I got from the Chinese embassy, I still asked myself, how do we find out what's actually true and not here? But we have, what we have to note is that they actually did the research as well. They took the effort to actually look into things he did 25 and 30 years back in Sweden. That was before internet. They couldn't search for it on internet. They had to do it in other ways. And they found small pieces of information which they put together into a completely false case. And uh, only the fact that they have done this is interesting, I think. And it, it is an example of a more active approach from, uh, from China when it comes to influencing and uh, well, giving propaganda to the people in other countries. I would like to, us to s end with that bigger perspective because nobody can believe that Gui Minhai is the last publisher to be snatched or, or the last publisher to be influenced or pressured and nobody can think, can, can believe that this is the end of the soft power campaign from China. And one of the biggest internet companies today is a Chinese company, I think they're number six, Alibaba. Very few know of it here because it's hard to read their adverbs. But uh, it's known in China, better known than others. Um, we also know that the Chinese business world is totally controlled by the Chinese government and the Communist Party. Yuya, you as somebody who knows China, what would 
ever prevent the president of China to use Alibaba and the soft power this giant on the internet could produce? What could prevent him from using it, from just calling them and say, go? Uh, not much. <laughs> it's, uh, very, uh, the control that the government has over the internet companies and everything is uh, very strict. And uh, yeah, you, you mentioned Alibaba, of course. But it's even more important, you have the microblogs and you have the WeChat, the messaging apps, where China does not only decide how those companies should operate, but they also use the services for uh, spying on what people are saying to each other, surveilling people, and uh, know several cases where you have a message history from Chinese internet apps that are used as evidence against writers, against journalists, but also against other uh, criminals. So I think that the grip that the Chinese government has over internet and uh, those uh, message uh, services in particular, I think they would never let go of that. Kristen, you had a comment on that. Well, well I, I would just say at the end that uh, concerning Guy Minhai, I'm, I'm impressed how, how the Swedish authorities are working on this and how your organizations are working on it. But I think it's very important to not, not letting this be a match bet between China and Sweden. So I think the EU part is very important. And, and I know they are working very, very hard in the EU Council on this. And that is so important. And also the international part of it. We have to be helping all of us all the time. But especially I'm, I'm very happy to see that EU will keep on fighting. This is an important principle. A EU citizen in Chinese jail without a fair trial, that is important. May I just ask you one thing? Those in Sweden who have the best contacts in China are business people. Much better contacts than we have. Uh, have you seen any Norwegian businessman or businesswoman on a higher level expressing their views on China? Or are they just as silent as their Swedish colleagues? I think they are just as silent. And can you push them in any way? Because publishers are part of business? Yeah, well, <clears throat> It's probably easier when there's a, there is a case that you can get involved in. It's more difficult for them to criticize on a general level, I think. But yeah. if there was a Norwegian citizen, I, we would have pushed them. Good. Yes, Per, last word. No, I was uh, coming to that, actually. I think that the role of companies is very interesting. And uh, that one of the few ways we actually still have an opportunity to influence uh, for example, I think that still some of the components in this uh, surveillance technique you mentioned are provided by Western companies to the Chinese companies who's using them to look to what people are doing in China. And uh, we have a number of Swedish companies uh, active in China and probably more able to influence them than uh, the Swedish government or PEN or the publisher organizations. That's what we're waiting for. Let's start pushing them. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, and thank you for your attention. And don't forget to look at the empty chair. And the book that Julia has written is to be obtained, I think, from Eva Yedin, the head of the Publishers Association. Yeah, and Julia's book. Thank you very much, everyone.